you. Thank you guys all for coming out on a Thursday evening. And for those of you who are on Zoom, I appreciate you taking time out of your night to watch me talk on Zoom, which is, um, I know there's other things you can do with your time. So um, as Kat said, I am, while well, I am the curator of vertebrate paleontology at the Auburn University Museum of Natural History, my day job is anatomy lab coordinator for the vet school at Auburn. And that's the other reason I'm down here is to talk about whales. Um, so um, I'm excited to do both. Um, and before I get started, so I know um, the one thing I want to make sure that everybody leaves here having done is touched a real dinosaur. So I have, I have our token real dinosaur bone that we let people handle. It's fairly heavy, so when it comes around to you, don't drop it. Um, but everybody can leave tonight saying you actually held a piece of a real dinosaur. So this is actually the, it's actually this end, the we call it the distal end of an upper arm bone called the humerus uh, from a long neck, long tailed dinosaur called a sauropod that I'll show you a picture of here in a minute. Um, it will take probably a while for it to get around. So I'll get started now and kind of go that way and back and forth like you're passing the offering plate or something. Um, and like I say, it's kind of heavy. So, so every that that's that particular dinosaur was found in Texas. Um, it's about 120 million years old. That particular bone is. So um, anyway, everybody everybody can say you held a dinosaur. So, um. Me and my friends that study dinosaurs, we get together and we like to talk about minutia, about bones. We like to pull out vertebrae and talk about things like super infra prezygopophyseal laminae and things like that that would bore you to tears. So I decided we weren't going to do that. Um, but um, there have been some exciting things, that advancements in paleontology. And when I say recent years, we'll call anything from, say, 2000 on recent because that's recent to me. Um, Certainly when I was most of your age, we had, were just figuring out that dinosaurs were warm-blooded. So um, we're, we've, we've made some great strides. And um, before I get started, so uh, most of you are older, but if I, if the average audience I talk to is between like sixth and 10th graders, and they're all going to tell me that their favorite dinosaur is T-Rex. But um, T-Rex, Velociraptor, or Spinosaurus. Those are the big three right now. Um, but my favorite dinosaur is this animal right here called Camarasaurus. And so dinosaur names are, in, are usually in Latin and they all have meaning. So Camarasaurus means chambered lizard mainly because of all of the open spaces in the vertebrae that would have been occupied by air sacs like modern birds. And this is the most beautiful sauropod dinosaur ever found called CM11338. I know you're Weird that that's how we talk about them with specimen numbers. Um, and the only thing this 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 with particular animal was missing these four little vertebrae right here. And um, actually, this hip bone has been replaced, and a few of these bones have been moved back. If you, I've got pictures of the original as it was found, but it's pretty much like it was found, um, including the bones up here that support the throat. If any of you watch NCIS, you know about hyoids and hyoid fractures. Probably that's the hyoid bones in the in that particular animal. Anyway. Um, so this is how big they got. This one's a juvenile. He's only about 20 foot long. Uh, but you can see they got pretty big. Here's his skull up here in the front. When I get done and when we get done talking, I welcome you to come up and look at any of this stuff. You're welcome to take pictures of it, anything you want to do. Um, I always try to bring a few props with me. Um, and they got pretty big. So this is, this is my son with the Shoulder blade, so the shoulder blade is this bone right here. This is called the scapula. Scapula coracoid if they're fused together. That's that bone from a much larger animal. That's Supersaurus, Supersaurus vivianae at the Brigham Young University Museum of Natural History. Uh, my son, that he says he's a human scale bar. So um, you, can, you can get some idea of how big these are. And uh, it's definitely easier moving around giant sauropod bones when I was y'all in my 20s like most of y'all than when I'm in my fifties. But uh, having him around was very handy. He was, he did, he did a lot of, he did a lot of work. He was a great research assistant this summer. Um, and this wasn't in my, this wasn't in the title of the talk cause this particular paper is literally hot off the press. So if you, you might see the date up there, 12th, June, 2024, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty recent. And one of the authors of this paper 
is my one of my best friends, Dr. Brian Curtis of Fossil Crates, and um, Carrie Woodruff and John Foster. I know all three of them, and they were they wanted to see if they could figure out how old some of the super giant sauropods were. So this is Mark Hallett's picture of uh, what used to be called Seismosaurus. Seismosaurus is a great name; it means earth shaker. Um, but unfortunately, here recently. Um, a different work by other people have shown that Seismosaurus is really just a Diplodocus, which is a kind of a common Morrison uh, genus of sauropod, but still really cool. This animal was 100 plus feet. They looked at this animal in Supersaurus. Supersaurus was about 120 feet. And what they did is they sectioned the ribs. And this is not from their paper. So this is from Dr. Holly Woodward's uh, amazing paper in 2015 on bone histology. Histology is looking at the microscopic structures. Um, bone histology of uh, a myosaur. So a myosaur is the good mother lizard because originally Jack Horner identified it from babies and he found some of the first nesting sites of dinosaurs and some of the first evidence that the, that the adults actually cared for their young and so they, they named it myosaur. To my knowledge, it's the only dinosaur with a female um, name, with feminine name. Um, at any rate, this right here is a section through a bone. And you can see these are all, every one of these little holes here would have been occupied by blood vessels and, and uh, cells, so osteocytes. And you can see there's sort of a boundary here. Everywhere you see a yellow arrow, you can see there's a boundary. So they realized and by looking at modern animals that we know how old they are and looking at these fossil animals, you see these same patterns in modern animals and you can count those lines and see how old that animal is. So we call those lags, which means lines of arrested growth. So that's because that represents that period of time, you know, during the lean part of the year when they weren't getting as much to eat. But you can see that they were in this particular dinosaur, they were growing a lot when they were really small, and then it kind of slows down towards the top. And you get right up here at the top of this bone, out towards the outside of the bone, and you end up with a bunch of these little lines laid right down on top of each other. And we call that an external fundamental system. And all that really means is a bunch of lags laying on top of one another, showing that the animal's not growing in between. So he's kind of reached what we call a maximum adult size. At any rate, so, you, so like I said, you can count these. And the problem is, though, most of the big, they, used, they started doing this with limb bones um, because they were big and easy to section. But once you get beyond a certain age, all of these, this stuff on the inside starts getting reworked. The bone gets remodeled, and so you can only count so far. Well, they found out that if they looked at ribs, or it's, they not, they're not the only ones, but it's been shown that if you looked at ribs, you can get a much better count of those lines, and there's much less reworking of the bone. So looking at that, looking at the number of lags, they were able to document. So CM94 is actually the uh, patasaurus that's mounted at the Carnegie Museum. And they were able to, to show that, um, you know, it's only estimated with lags to be in the mid-20s, like 23, 24. The oldest known dinosaur up until this paper was a theropod from South America that was a dated to 50, it was, it was estimated to be 50 years old. The old, oldest sauropod was actually a Camarasaurus that was 40. And so they were able to show that this, this is the Seismosaurus slash Diplodocus alorum from New Mexico. They were able to show that that animal was 60 years old. So that is officially the only, oldest dinosaur that's been documented to this point. Somebody will probably find one older. The Supersaurus material though, their, their software told them it should be 225 years old, and they don't believe that. Um, but it's so old that they can't, they can't quite calculate how old it is. So probably over 60. Um, anyway, that's cool that we, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, when I was in my 20s, I, I didn't know that we were going to be able to tell how old an individual dinosaur specimen was. And I think that's really neat stuff. Okay, so... Another kind of sort of one of those fundamental, wasn't really a paradigm shift in paleontology. It seems like something that should be fairly straightforward. 
Oh. Sorry. Well, y'all got the... So they've been listening to me yap and they couldn't see anything? I'm really sorry, guys. Whew. That's the visuals are the only thing that makes this... Makes this so... Um, did anybody have any questions about that while we're waiting? Wow. You're like my best students. Yeah. So are they considered ADLI, like they a fish or they a tree? Like yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're right. So they're, if you have a, if you had the full bone, and of course the bone's huge, so we can only see little slices of it. But if you had the whole bone, you would actually see that they change their widths as they go around. They're not perfect circles, like probably like you see in fish and certainly like you'd see in tree rings or something like that. So it's great if, you know, when you see sections like that one Holly found, that's about as pretty as I get. Um, sometimes you have to take multiple samples and interpret them. Um, and and uh, we're, we're, it's interesting because we want to, one of the things we want to do uh, with the project now is see how old Alabama alligators are because the alligator harvest in Alabama, um, there is at least concern amongst some of the people that are involved in that that we're over harvesting those animals because they grow slower in Alabama probably than they do, certainly than they do in South Louisiana, but we don't know what the growth curve is. So we're going to try to use this same technique to figure out how old a 12 foot alligator is in Alabama, which our guesses are maybe 50 years old. We just don't know. So it's, it has a lot of application. So the, she's, you're asking why they grow different here. So we're, our climate up here is in Uf Lake Eufaula, which is kind of the hub of alligator populations in Alabama, is much more temperate than South Louisiana. So the average temperature is significantly lower. And so since all crocodilians are, are ectothermic, their, their growth is dependent upon the ambient temperature. And so they, they found the optimal temperature for them is about 92 degrees. All right. So now that we are all on board, hopefully all you guys out there in the on the Zoom can also see. Um, this guy right here, Dr. Larry Whitmer, um, he came up with this concept he called the extant phylogenetic bracket. And by that, he means that we look at, in the case of dinosaurs, we look at their an ancestor and we look at a descendant of dinosaurs. And you look at the characters of those, some, whatever you're looking at, and if it's the same in the ancestor and in the descendant, we're making the assumption that it was there in dinosaurs as well. If it's in one but not the other, then you have to use other lines of evidence to figure that out. But anyway, it's a, it's a fundamental concept that honestly somebody should have th thought of a long time ago. Um, but Larry did a great job of uh, articulating it. And in this case, sort of the bracket for dinosaurs in general Crocodilians are archosaurs, just like dinosaurs are archosaurs, but they branched off before dinosaurs evolved. Um, so that's an alligator, obviously. And then up top left there, that's a red-tailed hawk. So birds, we I used to say birds, well, first off, I'll tell you why I'm 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 absolutely confident that birds are dinosaurs now, but there was a there was a time in my life when I wasn't really one of those people that was on board with birds or dinosaurs. Um, but based on everything we know now. Birds aren't the descendants of dinosaurs. They are dinosaurs. We can't, we can't no longer find a point where we can say, this feature is a dinosaur and that feature is a bird. It's a continuum. And so birds are living dinosaurs. So I don't have to answer that silly question about how the dinosaurs became extinct anymore. I just tell people there's 10,000 species of them. Get over it. They made it through. They're fine. They're okay. Anyway, so um, as an example of this, you still? Okay. All right. Well, I mean, you know, that's a, so anybody got it? Yeah, you got a question? Awesome. Oh, that's an excellent question. So she said with dinosaur growth rates, how long does it take them to reach adult size? So um, Christy Curry Rogers did a study of sauropods where she looked at apatosaurus, which is one of the bigger sauropods, and she took a growth series from, from really sm the smallest animals she could find up to adults. And what she found is that their growth rates most close, closely matched 
modern, I think, gazelles is what she said in her paper. And I think the estimate was that they would reach adult size in about 15 years. That's one animal, of course. Um, but I think it's probably, you know, for, for the larger dinosaurs, you're looking at no more than 10 or 12 years probably to reach, you know, full adult size uh, for most of them. So um, that's, the, that's as good, that's as much as we know at the moment, but, but they definitely grew fast. And you can tell, you can tell because when you look at those um, growth rings, they're really thick or really wide in the middle and then they get smaller as they go. So you can tell that they're growing at a much faster rate early on. And with these theropods, we don't know how much weight they were. We don't know how much weight the T-Rex is putting on, but I can tell you that most T-Rexes are not really old. I think the oldest Tyrannosaur, I think they might've, I think they might've found one is about 41, 42, but, but a lot of them are teenagers even, or twenties. They're, they, they weren't, they weren't really that old. Uh, most of them, they lived a pretty rowdy life. Uh, we will see in a minute. Um, so this is a this is a very easy example. So watch this alligator open his eye, and you're going to see this thing here. This is called the third eyelid. You see that open up. So if I in crocodilians, that third eyelid is actually clear, and they open their eyes underwater, and they basically use it like swim goggles um, to cover over the to cover over the eyeball. If we look at birds. So first off, one of the things, of course, birds are dinosaurs. So just like all dinosaurs, they have these bones that support the eye called the sclerotic ring. And that's because their eyeballs are enormous. So this is, a, this is the skull of an owl. Um, a barred owl, which is a typical owl we have here in Alabama, has eyeballs bigger than your eyeballs, or at least as big as your eyeballs uh, in a bird that's that tall. So um, they have these bones to support the sclera, the white part of the eye uh, on the inside. Um, but they also have these nictating membranes or third eyelids here in the corner. So your third eyelid, if you put your finger in the corner of your eye, there's a little bump there. That's about all you've got is a mammal of your third eyelid. But they also have a functional third eyelid. And uh, this, is my, this is my hen, Connie. And you can see this is her normal, and there's her with her third eyelid closed. It's kind of opaque in birds because they're not actually looking out of it when they sweeps across the eyeball. Um, but um, so crocodilians have it, birds have it. Therefore, it's almost a certainty that dinosaurs, that other non, we call them non-avian dinosaurs now, since birds are dinosaurs. All non-avian dinosaurs also had eyelids. Um, kind of as an aside, if you've ever watched Jurassic Park, if you haven't watched Jurassic Park, I don't know why you'd be at this thing, but um, uh, you can see that this is the, I think this is blue, um, with, their, with these vertical pupils, all the raptors, uh, the, the dromaeosaurs in Jurassic Park, always have these vertical pupils like this. And you see this in crocodilians. This is an alligator here on the right uh, because they're active at night. And so that, that little slit just lets in a little bit of light during the day. And then at night, they can open it wide and they can take in a lot of light. Um, but bird, the, the birds that we call raptors, the hawks and owls and eagles, they actually all have round pupils like this guy up here. And it's most likely that most of us think that these theropods also probably had round pupils, but they don't look scary on TV. Um, because these guys are for the most part predators in daylight. And so they don't, they, you know, they don't have, even owls though have round pupils. So you can see this is a Diplodocus. It's, reconstructed for a recent paper by Carrie Woodruff, and they've given it round pupils, which is probably what they should have. So a little aside. All right, so the main thing, one of the main topics of the discussion, T-Rex lips, right? So I remember in 1993 when I went to the premiere of Jurassic Park, yes, the original one, um, and I saw these things for the first time, and I, I was like, Oh my gosh, they've made di dinosaurs are real now. Um, this is Stan Winston's uh, T-Rex that they built, of course, full size. Actually, I think a little more than full size. Um, but you can see that he has this huge, these huge teeth sticking out the side of his face. And it really obviously lends to the overall look of that animal. By the way, when stuff makes it to the back back there, y'all can just set it off to the side and I'll get it after we're done. Um, 
so that was for most of us when you when you grew up in the 90s that's your idea of Tyrannosaurus Rex um but I thought I would I thought before we looked at the evidence one way or the other we would look at some art because paleo artists those of us that study dinosaurs we we try to get you try to get the public excited about dinosaurs we try to get you excited about dinosaurs but without paleo artists honestly we would just be showing pictures of random bones stuck together and you wouldn't be very excited what excites you is thinking about these animals as living creatures and i personally don't have the ability to draw those so um just to show you this is the first representation of Transverse rex as far as i'm aware it's by charles r knight uh charles knight was he was one of the very first artists to to make pictures of dinosaurs edward drinker cope that's one of the two uh scientists him and marsh were, were involved in the infamous bone wars he was one of the ones who directed these these paintings first off you can see his tail while not on the ground is kind of dragging when they when they first found him and realized they walked on two legs they just put him on two legs like people like standing up with the tail hanging out the back um but what's interesting to me is you can see he does not have teeth hanging out the side of his face he has lips like a modern lizard because that's they they were at the time they weren't even thinking they were they just they were just reptiles like any other reptiles and so he probably used he probably used some kind of iguana or something like that is his model for the facial structure. So that's that's the early and also you can't tell it here in this picture probably from back where you are, but he has three toes and three hand fingers. I mean on his hand, of course, T Rex only has two. Um, but you know, they didn't have much to work. Then uh moving up to 1947, you got this is this is one of the most famous, this is part of one of the most famous dinosaur paintings in the world called the Zalinger mural at the Yale Peabody Museum. It's called The History of Life, and it's it covers a wall about like this one on the other side, maybe a little longer. And this is just a little piece out of the middle of it. If you ever get up on the Northeast and you ever get to Yale, you owe it to yourself to walk in and look at that thing. Regardless of what how accurate it is now or anything else, it was just an amazing accomplishment in 1947. Um, and of course, we've moved, this is the Cretaceous. There's your duck-billed dinosaur. You gotta have your ankylosaur and your triceratops. It is required. By the way, you notice there's a triceratops. You have to have an ankylosaur and a triceratops in every T-Rex picture virtually. I found a few without them, but most of them are going to have it. It's just absolutely required. And they've got to be trying to kill each other. Those, those, are, the, those are the two requirements. But you can see he's, he, they didn't want to show what his tail was doing, so he kind of hit him behind some, some fronds here. But, but we've got these big teeth. Well, I don't know how Zallinger would have drawn their mouths closed because as you'll see, most people never draw their mouths closed. They draw them open because that makes them more menacing. Uh, so I can't tell you, but he, he's given something approximating lips there. Then uh, this is Zednik Burian in the 1960s. Um, so this is another T-Rex attacking the duck bill. Um, and he's gone, you know, he, once again, he's gone for the mouth open look, but the teeth are very, very prominent. In both of these, the teeth are very, very prominent. This is uh, Mark Hallett in 1985. Mark is one of my favorite artists. Not only is he an amazing artist and he loves sauropods like I do, but he paint. He, he only has one arm. I, he literally paints better with one hand than I can paint with two and most people. So he's, he's, pretty, he's pretty amazing. Um, and you can clearly see the two fingers now on T-Rex. Once again, we got the teeth sticking out from the lips here where you can see them over the lips he's kind of showing their mouth closed there and it's sort of done the best of both worlds i've got kind of lips but i can also see the teeth like he's literally like he's grinning um which i'm sure he's probably commissioned to do it like that because uh he he does most of the commission work um moving into the 2000s and james gurney so james gurney in case uh he he wrote the uh dinotopia books so if any of you have ever read Dinotopia, he wrote those and illustrated them all, but he's also has illustrated a number of, um, of, of dinosaurs for articles. Um, and this particular one, this is actually a Despletosaurus, I believe, not a Tyrannosaurus, but um, you can see that he's got this one with his mouth closed and he's got the teeth hanging over the side here, kind of like the T-Rex in Jurassic Park. Um, and then this one's 
course, drinking over here. Now he's got their tails off the ground nice. You can see their back is horizontal, which is actually how they would have walked. They didn't walk with their tails up and down on the ground. Oh, and there's the obligatory ceratopsins off this side. Um, this is Julia Satani. He's he is one of the finest paleo artists working today, and um, he mainly does his work. His art is digital, and we'll see some more. We'll see another piece of it in a bit. This is supposed to be um, a pair of tyrannosaurs courting. We have lots of evidence that they're. We don't know if it's their courtship or what, but they definitely, there are definitely lots of evidence that they interacted with each other in very, uh, you know, intense ways. Um, so this one, you can, of course, he's got the teeth visible on the outside here as well. And then this is probably one of the craziest Tyrannosaur restorations I could find. So this is Lewis Ray in 2013. Um, so he took the, we, we know that many, if not, most theropods had feathers now. We found there have been feathers found with most of the different major groups of theropods. And we have recently found, or they, there's been one found called DeLong that was a small tyrannosaur that they've actually found impressions of feathers with. So at least some tyrannosaurs apparently had feathers. Lewis decided to go whole hog and totally feather them. This is actually a Displetosaurus, I know that. And you can, but he's showing this interaction where they're fighting with each other. Um, which we know no happened, but you can also see, of course, he's got the teeth outside of the oral extra oral tissues or lips. So let's look at some real T-Rex skeletons. So this is this place is insane. So this is the Black Hills Institute um, in South Dakota. Me and Jack visited there here recently this summer, and this is Stan. This is a cast of Stan the T-Rex right here. Um, so Peter says he has the most dinosaur fossils per square foot. He doesn't necessarily have the biggest museum, but he has the most fossils per square foot of any museum in the world. I totally believe it. There is, it's insane what he's got packed into this thing. But uh, on this on this stand here, you can see these holes in the mandible here in the lower jaw. Some of these are supposed to, that one's supposed to be here, but th some of these are not. And um, it, they they match pretty well, at least, the circumference of, of other Tyrannosaur teeth. There are alternating hypotheses about them because you see them in almost every Tyrannosaur specimen that maybe there, there's some kind of infection or something like that, but it, they look like bite marks. Uh, they look like worse puncture marks. And I had to put this picture in. There's the, there's the duck bill in the front, but there's his line of T-Rex skulls. So he has casts of almost all of the world's major Tyrannosaurus Rex skulls. And like a doofus, I didn't like take a picture of that. So I had to use that picture to show them because that's the only picture I have that shows them all back there. Um, but we'll look at one. So if we look at one right here, this is this one's called Pex Rex. Um, you can see, first of all, you can see these big teeth and I'm going to the next thing we'll pass around. So this is a cast. I don't have a real T-Rex tooth, unfortunately. Uh, but this is a cast from the front of the jaw, from one of these teeth right up here in the front. And when you hold it, you'll see that there's a part of it that's really rough, and then there's a really smooth part. The smooth part about that, that's what would be sticking out of the out of the jaw. The rest of this would be anchored inside of this, uh, probably this lower jaw. I think this is from the lower jaw. So you can get an idea of how big they were. Mm -hmm. um, and you can the other thing you can see is these kind of snaggle tooth, right? The teeth are not the same all the way across. They go up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's not preservational. So all dinosaurs lost their teeth and replaced them on a regular basis. But they they did not lose them in any order. And so, like in this case, this tooth here is just coming in. This tooth here would have another one underneath it trying to push it out. Um, and so they got that kind of snaggle tooth look to them because of that. But remember the holes we're talking about? There's some there. There's some there. See, there's one there. There's one there. They're all over on all these Tyrannosaurus Rex skulls. It looks like they were, it's like they were like just reaching over and like biting each other. Um, also, you can see this line of little holes here on the top and on the bottom. Those are foramen, we call those nutrient foramina. 
when you see those in the in most places, that's where blood vessels and nerves were going to supply either tissue or in the case of the bones, sometimes you see those little holes going into the bones and they're going in to supply the bones themselves. But those are those will be come into play here in a second as well. So if we look at a, we don't do not have a modern archosaur analog for transverse rex because crocodilians certainly don't look like transverse rex and birds, which are the closest direct descendants of dinosaurs. I don't know if you've looked at birds lately, but they don't have lips or teeth. So they have, we call their, that we call the thing on the front of their face a ramphotheca, which literally means nose cup, but it's a beak. So we have a fancy name for everything, right? So we, we, we have to kind of expand the, expand the box to find things that have faces that might be similar to transverse rex. So this is a parenti, which is a monitor lizard um, from Australia. And you can see that you do not see any teeth when his mouth is closed. There's, there's the edges of his lips. This is also probably a good point time to point out that when we say lips in dinosaurs, we're not talking about lips like you guys have, right? So regardless of what T-Rex had, he, he couldn't smile at you. Right, he could. They did not have the muscles of facial expression that mammals have. So we're talking about the the fancy term is extra oral tissue. So just something on the side of the uh, around the teeth that cover the teeth. So um, we use the term lips loosely here. So this is a Komodo dragon, and you can see the you can see this lip right here. Kind of does look like he's smiling, but I don't think he's really smiling. I think he's saying, "Come on over and let's, let me see if I can have you for dinner." But um, notice that you don't see any teeth here. This animal is not without teeth. You just can't see them. So those, so even with his mouth open, the teeth are not visible. Now there's some, there's some glands around the, around the lips. They call labial glands that also kind of contribute to sort of this puffy look around the edges. But if we look at the skull of one of these, this is the skull of a relative of the parenti, it's not a parenti itself, but I think you can see there's clearly teeth in there and big teeth, but you can't see them when the animal's mouth is closed at all. All right, so here's an American alligator. Clearly when alligator's mouth closed, you can see the teeth on the outside. Basically looks just like those reconstructions of a lot of the T-Rexes. Um, by the way, you can tell, I, I usually, Ask students how to tell. Anybody know how to tell an alligator from a crocodile? Yes, sir. So this is the answer I almost always get. So alligators have a rounded snout and crocodiles have a pointy snout. That is true for many of them, but there are a few like the mugger crocodile that actually has a more rounded snout. But there is a feature that will almost always work and that is the fourth tooth in the lower jaw in a crocodile is actually visible on the outside of its mouth because it's got little pockets there on the side of its face. And in alligators, all of the lower teeth fit into sockets in the upper jaw, so none are visible from the outside. There's other things. Um, crocodiles have salt glands on the inside of the base of their tongue, and they have these little dots. These little dots that you can see on the alligator's face, they go all the way under the chin in a crocodile. But anyway... This, is, this happens to be an alligator, but it could just easily be a crocodile. So there's an alligator skull, and you can see that these, these teeth on the inside fit into pockets on the top, and then there's the teeth on the outside right there. Like I said, that tooth right there would be visible on the outside in a crocodile. All right, so which one of those paradigms is true, or is there, is there best evidence for? Um, this is the paper. So Dr. Tom Cullen is actually also a curator of vertebrate paleontology with me at Auburn. We're really, we have, we have three of us that are vertebrate paleontologists now at Auburn and two of us study sauropods. So it's really, really cool. Um, but he and his colleagues decided to look at multiple lines of evidence. So the first thing they, they looked at was they looked at the, the enamel. So enamel is the hardest tissue in the body. It's what covers your teeth. This is a, this is a, actually this pletosaur tooth, if I remember right, it's, but it's a tyrannosaur tooth. They put the word tyrannosaurus in their paper because they knew that's the only way anyone would ever read it. That's not true, but it is true that if you put the word tyrannosaurus in it, it will make the national media. If you say big meat-eating dinosaur, 
Probably not. So, so he would, they were very clever and used the word Tyrannosaurus in their paper everywhere they could. Um, but if you look here, so this is showing the cross sections of these two places, B and C, that white line that you can see right there, black line on top, that's the enamel. That's the thickness of the enamel. And on the inside and the outside of the tooth, and we refer to the outside as the labial side and the inside of the lingual side because your tongue's against it. On both sides of that tooth, it's the same thickness. You can see it's the same thickness on both sides. And of course, it down here towards the base, it gets thinner and thinner and goes away as it gets into the jaw. If you look at an alligator, so this is an alligator tooth. This section up here is hard to, a little harder to tell, but the enamel is this part out here. The inside of the tooth has enamel. The outside of this tooth actually has no enamel because it's been worn away. And if you look at a tooth that's coming in down here, you can see it has enamel there on both sides. So alligators start out with a consistent covering of enamel. And then as it gets worn throughout through life, it gets more asymmetric and you end up with not only outside and enamel on the inside. So they made that they they said this is evidence that Tyrannosaurus, because this tooth here, they found a tooth that was this was an old tooth, actually. It was about to, you know, it had been erupted a long time. Tyrannosaurus seemed to have kept their teeth for about a year before they lost them. So since they have no evidence of changes in enamel here, they made the argument this enamel was covered. It was not exposed to the outside, to the element. So that's one line of evidence. They also looked at those little foramina we're talking about. And if you look up here, at the, this is a, a, a branded lizard. You can see that they have these pits that go along the side of the face. Same thing with this marine iguana. Alligators have them, but then like I talked about, they have those pits all over their head. They're called isos and tegumentary sense organs. It's how an alligator can tell can orient towards prey that's dropped in the water or whatever. All right, and then if you look down here at Tyrannosaurus rex, it has the same thing. Well, another paper showed that if you have over 100 of those, those animals with more than 100 of those were not did not necessarily have lips, but the ones that had less did. And so all of these have less, and they also show up in the same place as you would expect for animals that had some kind of extra oral tissue. So then the, the next, the, the argument that's been raised the most about how T why T Rex could not have had lips like a lizard, like a like a branded lizard, is that the teeth are just too flipping long. You know, you're passing around that tooth. You can see how big it is. So what they did is they measured tooth lengths, the, the length of the tooth that's sticking out, you know, below the out of the jaw against the length of the skull for the longest teeth. And what they found out is the Salvador monitor here actually has longer teeth relative to its skull than T. rex does. Admittedly, it's a much smaller animal. But they showed pretty clearly that there's no reason based on the length of the tooth alone that Tyrannosaurus couldn't have had lips. So this was their, this is their, um, their conclusion that Tyrannosaurus that all the evidence points to the fact that Tyrannosaurus probably when they close their mouth, you would not see teeth on the outside, which I'm pretty sure that the uh, people who make Jurassic Park are not going to care for the next movie. But um, I think that's really interesting. And I think it's cool that you got so many, you got multiple lines of evidence. I also have a friend named Tracy Ford who believes that all of that is totally wrong. And he has a totally different hypothesis about how T-Rex did not have lips. And he makes arguments based on the shapes of the skull the articulations of the jaws and some other things like that. So it's not a done deal. And the thing, I, the thing I love about science is we put forward a hypothesis or these people, in this case, Tom and his colleagues put forward a hypothesis. One of you guys sitting out there, maybe you get really excited about it and think either, dang it, I want them back the way they were, or this is, this is a really cool topic. Maybe I should take it and look at some other different groups of animals. And you do the next thing with it. And that's how science progresses. So this is not necessarily a definitive answer, but it is, um, that's the evidence for it. And there is, a, there is a restoration of a T-Rex swallowing, probably a ceratopsian, if I was guessing. Um, and you can see in this case, they've got the teeth up inside of these extra oral tissues or lips. So that's their hypothesis for that. All right. So that would, remember that was half the title, um, T-Rex lips and feathered hips. So we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about 
feathered dinosaurs here. So this is, uh, this is actually an archaeopteryx specimen that's here in the United States that you can go see. So there are only a handful of these beautiful archaeopteryx specimens. Um, archaeopteryx, as you can see, means ancient wing. This thing's actually from the Jurassic. So almost all of the radiation of birds that we can see, that we see evidence for, happened in the Cretaceous. And most of those specimens come from something called the Jehol Formation in China. Probably 80% of the really beautiful bird, bird dinosaur transitional fossils come from that area. But uh, this animal here was a true, was a bird, but you can see it was a bird. You might not be able to see them, but he has teeth there. He has the little bones in his eyes that I showed you. Um, but this is, a, this is from a place called the Solnhofen Limestone. And while you can see impressions of the feathers right there, you can see the impressions, there's none of the actual tissue left from the animal when it died. Um, this specimen in particular, this animal, there's actually multiple specimens of this animal called a uh, microraptor. Um, and this is the animal that sort of changed my mind about birds and dinosaurs and the fact that birds pretty much have to be dinosaurs. First off, this is actually, this one actually does preserve soft tissue. So you can actually see the, see this black stuff. That's actually a carbon film and that will come into play in a second because we can tell more than just, oh, this thing had feathers. Um, but you can see that these are, these look just like the feathers on a bird. They're what we call asymmetrical feathers, which are typically associated only with flying birds, at least up until this point. And they also, I mean, microraptors like, hey guys, feathers on their wings aren't enough. He's also got feathers on his legs. So these are feathers coming off of his legs, AKA feathers on his hips. That's a, how do I rhyme something with lips, right? So what's hips? Um, so he's got feathers down here. He's got feathers up here. And, and he has feathers coming off of his tail back here as well and of course he has this big long tail and how do i know this isn't a non uh or an avian theropod how do i know this is not a as a dinosaur not a bird well that big long tail is one of the things but this claw right here see how that claw is much bigger than all the others that's the quote unquote killing claw of, of a raptor so this is a true true dromaeosaur just like the velociraptors in Jurassic Park, except the velociraptors are actually way too big because real velociraptors are about that tall, about like turkeys. The ones in Jurassic Park, um, they didn't have a dinosaur that big when they made it. And uh, Jim Kirkland found Utah raptor while they were making Jurassic Park. So it's cool that they made a fake dinosaur and then they found a real dinosaur that matched the size of the fake dinosaur. Um, but anyway, point is that big claw is diagnostic for that group. And so this guy has it. So he's a little, that's why he's called microraptor. And there's a, there's a fossil or skeletal restoration of it. You can see there's the, there's the sickle claw on the front. Uh, there's a whole nother discussion about what that thing's really for. We're not going to do that. Um, so this is a reconstruction of it. This is one of the early reconstructions of it from the early 2000s. And what they've, one of the things that modern birds have that this thing does not you notice that it doesn't have anything sticking off of its chest, a keel, like modern, modern birds have a keeled sternum for the big flight muscles to attach to. And that's how we know for sure in the fossil record, an animal had powered flight when he has those keels on his sternum. These guys didn't have them. Doesn't mean he couldn't flap his wings, but he probably was not flying like an eagle. And so the idea was that, there, that these, that, that these, feathers on the legs gave them extra lift and they were able to glide more efficiently with the feather. And they, they put them in different configurations in wind tunnels and found out there was a configuration where they could actually glide really effectively um, using these feathers. At any rate, so this is a, you see the colors on this bird, right? So if you asked me the, the one thing I thought for sure, I would never be able to tell you about a dinosaur is what color it was. I mean, you don't never know what color they are. I got bones sticking everywhere, but I don't have, you know, so, but um, lo and behold, this first paper came out on color and fossil feathers. And another one came out about looking at something called melanosome. So there are basically three broad categories of color in birds. And, um, Dr. Hill at the 
at uh, the Museum of Natural History in Auburn is the world's expert on coloring birds. So I am not, uh, but you can have uh, a physical color that's caused by something called melanosomes, which is what these things are here. And the shape of these melanosomes actually is what determines the color. And that color, as you can see it, things like gray, brown, black, some of the iridescent, like kind of purplish colors like you see on grackles and things like that. You can have color derived from the food you eat, like carotenoids. So everybody, I'm sure everybody in here can tell me an example of one of those. A flamingo is the classic example of that. So I'm sure you all know that. So if you take your flamingo and you put it in your zoo and you don't feed it the right food that has the carotenoids in it, then they just get white. They, should, they, they, they turn white. And then there are colors that are caused by the, by the interaction of light on the feather itself. So some of the blues, reds, some of those kind of colors. Um, so we can't, we will, we might not ever know about some of those structural colors or the carotenoid type colors, but we can know about some of these others. And so this is, this paper was showing that the shape of these um, melanosomes gave you some idea of the color. So this is reconstruction of the color of Microraptor. Um, and you can see that a bunch of people worked on that. And what's cool is <coughs> there's a, this is a little, this is a, a thing, tip mouse here. This is the iridescent black feathers from a penguin, from a cormorant. Um, this is a palm cockatoo. I can't remember what kind of duck that is. And then this is Microraptor. So you can see these, these are fossilized, so they're not preserved, you know. But you can see this is kind of like, these look like kind of like sausages, and these look like cross-section through a sausage. And so they showed that they, they sampled different parts of Microraptor, and basically all of them look the same. And so this is, the, this is one of the very first not, hey, we think it looked like this, or I like these colors, so I made it this. But this is a scientifically, scientifically accurate reconstruction of the color of Microraptor. We know it was basically a black iridescent bird, probably would have looked a lot on the, you know, feathers would have looked a lot like grackle feathers. And so there's a beautiful painting of it um, there that you can see. And you can see they're showing them jumping off and gliding. Pro we don't know, one of the things we don't know is their lifestyle, but it makes sense that they might have climbed up trees, jumped off, glide for a long ways, land, climb up the climb up the bark on the tree and then get up higher and glide again. But and this we don't know this color of the front of the face here. That is that is supposition. But that's pretty amazing. I mean I never thought that I would see that. And we've done it or we they have done it with more than just these guys. So this is Anchiornis. Uh, that's that's uh, that looks like a bird that got run over by a Cretaceous truck. Um, but just to kind of get you oriented, there's his head right here. He has this little top knot on his head of feathers. Here's his arm right here, right there. There's his legs coming down. And then there's his tail, and you can see feathers all over his tail. You can see feathers out here on his wings, like that. And they did the same thing. What, but... I want to show you this first. So Julius Satani, as I told you, he's an amazing artist, but he works in digital format. Digital format art is great because you can change your art as the science improves. And so this was his original painting of Anki Ornis. I, I really like that one with that kind of rust red color on it, um, which is really cool. But we were, they were able to show, not in Anki Ornis, not only are there places with the melanosomes, but there were places that were devoid of them as well. And so that is a scientifically accurate, as we can be, um, estimation of the color of Anki Ornis. And it turned out that little tuft on the top of his head was kind of a rough, uh, kind of a buff color. So he got that right. Um, but it looks like the wings kind of look like a modern woodpecker with the black and white striping on them. And then the body, it turned out, wasn't really dark black. I think it had, I think it's because it had uh, less numerously tightly packed melanosomes. They, they assumed it's gray. So I think that's, I think that's really cool. Um, and then the last thing I was going to talk about, because, so 
what interests me, one of the things that interests me is there's very little fossils that tell you it, that or represent the animal at a moment in time when it was alive doing something. But dinosaur tracks do. So a track of a dinosaur, like this is the back foot of a sauropod right here um, at the Paluxy River in Texas. If you ever get up there, I go check it out um, in Glen Rose, Texas. Um, they're cool, but there's a limited amount you can do it. It's like, yeah, okay, he stepped there. That's cool. Uh, there's a theropod track. We can tell it's a theropod track because it's pointed in the front, so we can tell he had claws. Um, by the way, let's see. We'll pass around. This is a this is a toe claw here of one of those big sauropods. So this is basically what would it be the equivalent of the end of his thumb, where the nail is on your thumb. Um, from a modest size one. That animal is only about 70 feet long, probably. Uh, anyways, so what can we do with tracks? I mean, so if you have a trackway, so so if you if you take your left foot, your right foot, and your left foot, or your either either way, we call that a stride. So if you have a dinosaur trackway that preserves one of those strides, you can measure the length of the of the foot, and they Hutchinson and some others came up with a formula to calculate from the size of the foot the approximate hip height of that dinosaur. And if you have the hip height and the stride length, you can calculate the speed of the dinosaur. So we can get some estimation for how fast these animals are moving. I'm sure you probably won't be shocked to know that most dinosaurs weren't running at 50 miles an hour because you walk outside, most animals aren't running at 50 miles an hour. So you got preserved tracks. Most of them are animals walking. The fastest trackway that's been measured is a modest sized theropod, so not a Tyrannosaurus rex, running at about 25 miles an hour. That's the, that's the fastest record we have based on the actual trackway evidence. So I, I think that's really cool. And each different kind of animal makes different kinds of tracks, but we cannot assign a track to a particular genus of a dinosaur. So I can't say that's a Triceratops track, but I can, you can say that's a Ceratopsian track. So all of these have different names, which we're not going to go into. But um, the other thing tracks show is behavior in some cases. So this is the this is the Purgatory River in Colorado. These are all big sauropod tracks right here. And what's really awesome, here's a set of tracks in the Purgatory River. So there's a back foot, front foot, back foot, front foot, back foot, back. You can see them going like that. There's one. There's one right there. There's one right there, one right there, and one right there. Now, so how many dinosaurs is that? Five. There's five dinosaurs. So those dinosaurs could have all walked through one after the other and walked in perfectly straight parallel lines and never crossed each other's footsteps. But assuming they're not superstitious like we are, like stepping on cracks and stuff when we're walking on the sidewalk, Chances are they probably didn't do that. If you if you had five dinosaurs wander through the same same place at different time, they're going to cross each other's trackway. The fact that these are perfectly parallel, what makes the most sense is that those animals are walking in a group. So this is physical evidence for herding behavior in sauropod dinosaurs, which I find that just awesome. I think that's really cool that you can. And it's it's a we we find sauropods together all the time. We find big bunches of them together, and it seems like they hung out in big groups. But you can get an accumulation of bones without them animals hanging out together. But that's clear evidence that they, at least in that case, they were walking along side by side. And so I am. Um, I find that that kind of stuff interesting. This is uh this is the Apatosaurus at the. Carnegie Museum, if you ever get a chance to go there. Um, this particular little baby down here, um, they only have about uh, 20 bones from that, maybe not even 20 bones from that baby, and they needed some of the rest of them. And so I, for my PhD thesis, I was working on sauropod dinosaur limb biomechanics, and I needed 3D models, and I had 3D models of the bones. I also found out that baby, baby uh, um, sauropods and big sauropods have the same proportions in the limbs. That the limbs themselves grow asymmetrically. So we 3D printed them on the then $30,000 FDM printer at LSU. 
and they were put directly onto that baby. And I think that's probably some of the first 3D printed bones ever put on a, ever put into a mount in the world. Now it's very common. Literally RCI, Research Casting International, they 3D print all kinds of stuff. It's obviously the technology du jour these days. Um, but that was really cool. So I just had to show a sauropod at the end. All right. So that's uh, that's all I got. And I'll tell you, I'm happy to take questions from you and uh, let you guys come up and see some of this stuff. Um, all right. All right. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So every artist is different. Some artists look for the color of eyes that's going to match the best with the color that they gave the body because we don't know the color for most of the big dinosaurs. There are some of them that actually... They, they've got close-up pictures of raptor eyes, and they use those as models. James Gurney's one of those kind of people. He goes out into nature, and he, he takes pictures of all kinds of things that he can incorporate into his reconstructions. So I can't speak for every artist, but, but a lot of them look at living animals and try to find something that approximates the living animal. Um, but but every, every artist has a different, uh, different technique. Yep. Thank you, Ernest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do, do we do we know or do we think that dinosaurs saw color or and did they see color different than modern birds? So Modern birds have incredibly good color vision. They have way more, uh, I think it's cones, than we do. And they have a much better, they have much better color vision than humans do. They can see in actually multiple spectrums as well. They can see in, in infrared as well. Uh, some, many of them can. Um, the, like I said, that, that pattern matches, that, that pattern matches woodpeckers, modern woodpeckers pretty well. And, and it, it could be that that, I'm sure that that influenced Julius's, uh, painting as well and and it, if you ever look at a woodpecker on a tree it, they it's amazing how it breaks up their lines like you're saying i don't know if kind of like a zebra i guess um right yeah I, I, we really yeah I, I used to would say we will never know i won't say that anymore i'll say that right now there's no there's nothing that I know, evidence I know about the quality of the color vision that dinosaurs had. Like in, in modern mammals, for instance, large mammals have really poor color vision. I'm always, I'm always um, fascinated by the, the uh, I'm a, I hunt and fish as well, but I'm fascinated about hunters that refuse to wear like hunter orange out in the woods because they know the deer is going to see them, but deers can't see orange. So they just see gray. So they've, they've, a lot of people come up now with the, with camouflage, it's actually broken up pattern. I mean, uh, the orange where it's got, you know, kind of a camouflage pattern to it, to a deer that looks just, looks about like the trees. So, so big mammals we know have really poor color vision. Primates have pretty good color vision. Um, so it's probable that, that different dinosaurs had different degrees of color. Like it would, it would surprise me if, if sauropods had great color vision, for instance. Because they, there are these giant animals out on the plains. They don't, I don't know that they would need it. But it would would not surprise me at all if theropods had really good color vision. And if we ever find one of these, if we ever figure out a way to tell if any of them had could reflect bright colors like blues and reds, then we would then we'd have pretty good evidence. Because you're not going to have the only reason to have bright colors on your body is to tell your mate that you're vigorous and that you're 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 the one you know. I can be brightly colored and still not die. Come mate with me. So it's, it's so, so we, but we don't, we just don't have that, that evidence yet. But I think it, I, my, my guess would be that these small guys probably had pretty decent color vision. I don't know what would be preying on Anki Ornis. 
at the time, but uh, but maybe the bigger ones did not. Yep, Jack. There are any Texas birds that kind of retain that big old feathers on the leather configuration? There's no birds that I know of that retain the feathers on the tarsus, like the the tibia tarsus. Um, it's very weird. That's just the weirdest thing. I, I think that that was the thing that blew my mind is when I saw these. Like I said, we call them asymmetrical feathers because if you've got the shaft of the feather, the vein part of the feather is bigger on one side than on the other. That's something that used to only be associated with active flying birds until that animal was found. So that's true. So so they we we have bred chickens to have feathers. They're they're not the kind that stick off like a separate wing off the back, but we've done that to chickens. So there are four hundred about four hundred recognized breeds of chickens. Virtually all of them descended from red jungle fowl. So there's there's red jungle fowl, green jungle fowl, gray jungle fowl, and Lafayette's jungle fowl. Those are the four lip four wild chickens. That's all we had to start with. And now we have over 400 breeds that do crazy things. If you ever get find a cool chicken book, you never see some of the weird chickens. But but she's right. So we we bred them to have feathers on their feet, feathers in between their toes. Um, we bred them to have no feathers on their neck. Um, we bred them to have feathers covering the top of their head. It's amazing that we could get there from the genetics of red jungle fowl, which is just your, that's, if you ever want to see the OG generic chicken, red jungle fowl is it. That's about as boring as chickens get. Um, anyway, I like chickens. I, I have chickens, in fact. I have, a, I have a sticker on my door in my office that says I raise tiny dinosaurs. All right, anything else? Yes, sir. Yes. Sinusoropteryx. Yep. Yes. Yes. So we brought up the great point. So I did. I should have put Sinusoropteryx in here, but I knew that I didn't want to keep you here forever. Um, but it is a cool dinosaur. It's not. It's not a bird. It's not. It doesn't have the feathers, uh, asymmetric feathers like a like Microraptor does, but it, its body was covered in these almost like down feathers, like kind of, we could, they call them proto feathers. I don't know what a proto feather is, but it's a, they, they almost look like hair. And they were able to show, like you said, that, that there's a ring pattern on the tail. And so it would have kind of looked like the dinosaur version of a lemur. And it would have been, it would have had this, um, what's, what's the color? You say rough colored, like a reddish color, like a buff, yeah, like, like a ginger color, yeah. And I didn't put it, there's a whole nother one. There's a, they, they've actually found a, a bigger dinosaur, Cetacosaurus, one of the early Ceratopsians that they found that has preserved skin impressions. And it shows that it had, it had like brown stripes on its legs and then its back was, you know, kind of this uniform kind of brown color. It just blows my mind, this stuff that, you know, one day we may know what color T-Rex was. That's, that would be cool. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that, so he's talking about Borealopelta. So Borealopelta was found in a coal mine in Canada. And it's, there. you can watch video of it where they, they found it and then they uncovered it. They put this beautiful jacket around it, covered the whole thing, dug underneath it, put these big blocks underneath it. And these experts, these are engineering experts, right? They're coal mining engineers. They go to lift this thing out, and the jacket just splits in half like a, just crack, and then all the dinosaur pours out in little pieces. It's one of the most painful things as a paleontologist I've ever watched in my life. But they put it back together, and because of the breaks, they were able to see some of the internal stuff. There's actually preserved uh, stomach contents in this thing. Um, there is preserved skin, like you said. And all of the armor and everything is preserved perfectly in place. It's an, it's an, I got to see that specimen in person a few years back. It is, it is truly an amazing uh, specimen. And I think that they have done this because I think it's supposed to be a sort of a buff, kind of a brownish red buff color. That's how it's restored now. And I think that is based on some of that, uh, some of that skin data. Yeah, so like I said, there was a hundred, I mean, you know, I had to, had to pick a couple. But that's a really good point. That's a great... So these birds, um, these birds, 
fell into this is thought to be a really low energy lagoon situation. And it had to be a fairly anoxic, low oxygen environment because in a high oxygen environment, they just rot. Um, and there was clearly obviously nothing around tearing it apart. So if there, if it, if there was a, it was a high oxygen environment, you're almost certainly going to have fish and things taken apart. So they fell into a low oxygen environment. They were buried relatively quickly with this very fine grain sediment. And it created this compression fossil, just just like fossil leaves when you find fossil leaves and things. So it's a it's a very unique like the, like I said that I think these are all from the Jehol. I can't remember because I so the, the animals these animals are actually closer to you than the animals I study are to them. So these are all overburdened as far as I'm concerned. This is all the stuff you have to get out of the way to get to the sauropods. So. Uh, my my expertise is not in the Jehol formation, but I think that's where these are all from. Um, and and it's just this one place, and they they find this stuff all the time now. It's coming. It just comes out of China like crazy. Which so I hope we I hope we can maintain diplomatic relations enough with China to keep these keep these things coming and keep them, you know, being available to the Western world because there there's some amazing stuff there. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. So so lizards are like third cousin twice removed kind of thing. They're they're way they're so they're not on the they're not on the main they're what we call lepidosaurs. So they're they're not on the line at all the dinosaurs. So that's why I say when I showed you the ranted lizard and I said we're going to use this. The reason we have to use that is there's just nothing else around that's an archosaur that has um, extra labial tissue like lips that we can look at, unfortunately. So, so we're trying to find a modern analog to compare uh, to dinosaurs. It's it's almost certain that if, if tyrannosaurs did have those lips, they would not have been the exact same as the varanid lizards had. They would have been something, some kind of modified version of that, most likely, but. But yeah, so that's that's a good point. So we're, we're we're really reaching out. It's like it would be like trying to study something in a fossil human by looking at an aardvark. You know, it's we're not they're not the same. So I I I, I can that's a good question. Yeah, the word dinosaur means terrible lizard. So dinosaur was coined. The word dinosaur was coined in eighteen forty two. Um, by Sir Richard Owen in England. A terrible, I said, said me terrible lizard. It means terrible lizard. I think I said terrible dinosaur. It means terrible lizard. Saur means lizard. So almost every dinosaur's name has saur at the end of it. Saurus. Saurus is the masculine form of lizard. Saura, like Myasaura, is the feminine form. Um, so Tyrannosaurus rex, T rex, Tyrannosaurus. So, so T rex should be written T period rex, but we usually write T slash rex. But T is Tyrannosaurus rex is the full species name of, of that animal. I usually norm for everything else except Tyrannosaurus rex. I just say gen genera's names. Like I say Camerasaurus, uh, tr Triceratops. No, I never talk about Triceratops horridus. Anyway, who cares? Right? Tricer everybody knows what I'm talking about. But with Tyrannosaurus, usually people say T. rex uh, because they, they're just that's sort of our, that's in our vernacular. Um, but yeah, so that's that's how they got the name. So Tyrannosaurus rex means king. You usually take the species epithet and put it first. So king of the tyrant lizards. I'll show you the I'll show you the weirdest name thing. So this right here, I'm going to talk about this tomorrow. But this is a cast of a skull, um, and this happens to be Alabama's not this particular one, but this animal is Alabama state fossil. So this is a whale. Yeah, this is Bacillosaurus. So the word bacil so Bacillosaurus cetoides. So the this animal was originally discovered. The original bones were discovered in like the 1830s by a guy named Harlan, and he was told to describe them. And he named the he named this vertebrae Bacillosaurus. Bacillosaurus means king lizard. He thought it was a marine lizard. A reasonable deduction based on what he had, because all he had was a few vertebrae. He did not have this. Um. Then the good stuff started coming out from Alabama, found some good stuff in Alabama, and he took it over to Richard Owen 
in England. And Richard Owen went, you doofus, this thing is a mammal. It's clearly a mammal because he had a piece of the teeth and he could see that it had roots on it like mammal teeth, not the single roots that, that reptile teeth have. So he named it Zugalodon cetoides. Zugalodon means yolk tooth because of that, because of those that arch that the that the, they made. So by the laws of zoological nomenclature, the first name has priority and you can't change it. But because he because Harlan never gave a species epithet, he called it Bacillosaurus, we got to keep that. And because um, Owen gave it the species epithet Cetoides, the official name of this animal now is Bacillosaurus Cetoides, which means the whale-like king lizard. But it's a whale. It's a whale-like whale, even. So we're stuck with that name. It's like one of the worst names in science. But still, it's kind of cool. So that's pretty neat. The, this particular skull came from Louisiana. Um, I wrote a chapter in the Louisiana Fossils book on fossil whales of Louisiana, and so I had this in my office, so I've had it to look at. But um, this is a cast of our, our skull that we have down there. We have this skull uh, with a mandible, all the hyoid bones in the first 11 thoracic vertebrae, and a whole arm. So it's one of the more complete bacillosaurus from North America. At any rate, so how long is it? So this, this, this skull looks pretty big. Um, this animal would be about 50 feet long. So he's, he's more like a snake whale. So that if anybody's here, it's going to be in the evolution stuff tomorrow, whale evolution stuff. I'm sorry, I sort of gave away the best part already. But, um, but yeah, so, so he would have, this, this is a tiny skull compared to his body size. So he would have stretched at least to the very end of this room, if not a little bit farther. Um, very, very cool animal. Anyway, I like having props. All right, any more questions? Great ones, yeah. Yep. So the question was that since we find these things in these anoxic conditions, does that tell you about their lifestyle? Um, if they were marine animals, it would tell you about the environment that they were a little bit, potentially about the environment they were inhabiting because they're, they're just these incidental birds that somehow the question is how did these how did these animals end up there in the first place did they was there a um, say a volcanic eruption that that you know killed them because of uh, uh, New Era dawn or something the uh, uh, avalanche of glowing gas that killed them and then they fell in the water were they did they did they kind of try to fly too far let's say and they got out in the middle of this lagoon and couldn't make it any further and fell in there? Uh, did they wash in during a storm? I don't, you know, I don't know that we know the answers, answers to those things. I don't know the answers to those things. So that might, that would be something for like my buddy, Matt Lamana or somebody um, who actually studies these things for a living. Um, but probably doesn't tell you about their particular lifestyle because there's, there's no, tr there's no trees around there. So it's really, we, we think of these animals probably as sort of gliding from tree to tree. So it's kind of, kind of weird that they're out in this <laughs> Of this big lagoon, so yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what it. Now there are there are plenty of fossils of actual marine birds like Ichthyornis, Hesperornis, Hesperornis is one from out west that has almost no arms and these giant legs like a modern day loon, and yes, it was it it died where it lived, so we know it was a it was a water bird. Um, you mean because the modern day German? Well, so so the the idea is that Archaeopteryx. I think most people would would say that Archaeopteryx has some kind of powered flight. Its wings are so beautifully. He has such some asymmetrical feathered wings. I mean, they look like a modern bird wings. Um, but yes, you're all, they almost always are depicted in the trees and kind of gliding from one, you know, taking short flights from one tree to another. But they were found in the, once again, they're found in the Solenhofen limestone. And the, it's one of those cases where it's, 
we don't know if they live there. I don't know how they like they they would they would maybe lived on the islands. So the 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 best reconstructions I've seen of that area is you kind of got these lagoons with sort of islands scattered in them. But I think that that's one of those things we don't uh, we just don't know enough about. You know, this we just don't know about their daily lives at the moment.